I'm freezing up here. Holy smokes. But this is like the coldest room in the whole place. Good to go? Levels are okay? Good. All right, guys, thanks so much for coming. I'm really glad you guys are here. Uh, it's cool to see so many people uh, coming to find out about HFC. Uh, I know a lot of times I do, you know, I do talks that are on hacking topics and pack rooms, and then I do a talk about HFC, and it's like small rooms, and, and they're not all the seats are full. But I look at, I don't look at it that way. I look at it as, um, you know, a lot of people here are interested in something different, and I just think that rocks. So thank you guys so much for coming. Some of you aren't familiar with Hackers for Charity, so I just want to give a little intro to talk uh, about kind of what it is that we do, what HFC is about. This is our mission statement. Uh, we leverage the skills of technologists, we solve technology challenges for various nonprofits, and provide food, equipment, job training, and computer education to the world's poorest citizens. Okay, that's kind of our a corporate mission statement. You know, you're supposed to get everything in one sentence, and I have two, so I'm already breaking the rules, which I guess that's a hacker in me. Uh, the, one, the one problem with this is that it tends to be uh, a little boilerplate and uh, a little convoluted, and one of, the, one of the complications that I've had since I started Hackers for Charity four years ago is, is really answering this question well, and more specifically, getting other people to answer this question well. Um, and I'm going to hopefully fix all that in this talk. But to give you a little bit more detail for those of you that don't know what we're about, here's what we do. These are our major programs. We have a computer training center uh, in Jinja, Uganda, East Africa. And this training center is uh, operated free of charge right now. Uh, basically what we do is we provide free computer training, uh, job skills, we teach people how to do interviews, how to follow job paths, and most of our students are computer illiterate. Uh, and I, that's kind of an abused term because it doesn't carry a lot of weight here, but when I say computer illiterate, I mean have, have never touched a computer, have never touched a mouse. Uh, the, the, you know, the idea of you move your hand this way with the mouse and the cursor goes that way is completely foreign to them. And interestingly enough, a lot of those students are actually graduates of some, you know, technical school or some technical degree program. They have a degree in, uh, in computer technology and they've never touched a computer. So we get an awful lot of students that come here to actually touch the computer. <laughs> you know, they, they've, they've got head knowledge, but, you know, they have no practical knowledge. So this is our computer training center. It's pretty interesting. The, um, this, this center just expanded at DerbyCon this year. Uh, James Bray donated uh, three Pelican cases, 100 pounds each, filled with Dell laptops. I mean, these are i5s and i7s, like two years old. Uh, more than a dozen of these things, and I'm kind of struggling with how to get, get them back to Uganda. But this year, we've already landed, you know, like 15 more seats in our computer training center, you know, just by us showing up. So that takes, us, uh, that takes us to about 40 seats up from 25. The other thing that is super cool about our training center and the reason that it's free is because uh, Art of Exploitation, which is a TCS brand, sponsored our training center for the next 18 months. And what that means is that they are paying for our rent, they're paying for our staff salary, all of our utilities. That company is making this place free for students. So I think that's worth a big round of applause. It's a huge donation. Uh, the other major project that we have is, uh, is, strangely enough, a coffee shop and restaurant called the Keep Cafe. This is also in Jinja. This wasn't something we planned on doing. Uh, when we moved to Uganda about four years ago, we kind of went thinking, uh, what are we going to do here? And we spent a year kind of going, well, what's needed? You know, what, what is needed in this place? And strangely enough, it, it turned out that, you know, a restaurant that served American food, um, that, you know, gave people a really good cup of coffee, gave them a good internet, was something that was necessary because so many people came and did hard work and, you know, were really roughing it when they'd come to this place and simply needed to recharge. 
And I, my wife and I, we didn't know anything about running a restaurant, you know, but uh, all the pieces sort of came together and after a lot of prayer and, you know, sort of scratching our heads and going, really, this is what we're supposed to do? Like everything fell into place. You know, we found people that had catering experience and we got a coffee machine shipped over to us, you know, an Italian espresso machine. And it, it was just like this stuff kept falling on us and we're like, oh, okay, we're supposed to run a restaurant. So we run this um, sort of as a kind of work program, I guess. It's not really a successful business. Uh, on, on good years, we break even. This year, we did not because we had road construction right in front of our place. So large buses and stuff couldn't get in, and they went to other places. Uh, but you know, we've got about uh, 15, 16 people that are full-time employed through this project. And in the years that we break even, we look at that as a great thing. Uh, this is also the hub where people bring in their computer equipment. NGOs that are on the ground, they'll bring in computers to be repaired. Uh, and of course, that's one of our huge services is doing NGO support. And people feel safe bringing their computers into a place like this. In a developing country, this is like a little oasis. This is like a paradise. And they come in and they're like, okay, I can trust my, you know, my Chromebook in this place and uh, my Pixel. I'm going to plug the Pixel. I saw a Pixel at DerbyCon this year and I was just drooling all over myself. Uh, unbelievable machine. So that's the Keep Cafe. The other thing that we do an awful lot of is we install computer classrooms. Uh, we'll find places that um, we think are really doing a good job, uh, that we kind of know where the money's going and we see that they're, it's a good place and we'll donate computer systems to them so that you know their staff and teachers can you know come in and they can bring students and children in and get computer training. So we have an awful lot of these, uh, these computer classrooms installed all over the place. Uh, the la uh, next to last thing is, uh, was kind of weird and another one of these things that fell on us. We have a leather program. And this was a work program for a village that was burned to the ground. And we found that uh, a lot of folks in this room donated to rebuild that village, you know, build the houses and all that. But the folks didn't have jobs, you know, they didn't have skills, and it backed up to a leather tannery. So Jen and I learned how to do leather crafting and started teaching, you know, how to make leather projects. And uh, we've got about another 15 people employed there in the leather program. And the, uh, another thing that is really very strange, and I have no idea how this happened, is um, when we first moved to Uganda, the rent was really high, and, you know, we had this place, and it, you know, there wasn't much to choose from, and so we're living in this place and thinking, man, we're paying a lot of rent in here because there's not a lot of real estate available. And this, this old British colonial came up for rent. Um, you can see it in the picture there. It, it, it looks crazy. It's, it's, this, this place is really unbelievable. Um, and it's one of the nicest places in Uganda, but it came available at the exact rent price that we were playing, paying in our current place and gave us the opportunity to run it as a bed and breakfast, which meant we could bring people in, take care of them, drive them around, help them with what they needed, give them technology support, give them a place to sleep. Uh, the food was easy because we had a restaurant and we'd bring our cook over. And it became another way to serve the community there in Uganda, just really help people. And even though I didn't look at it as a smart business move at the time, I was just like, really, we're supposed to do this? found out that, you know, with people staying as a bed and breakfast, it helped offset our rent. So it was like, you know, it, I don't want to call it a business, you know, I want to call it another one of these things where we kind of trade something that's costing us money for something that breaks even, and oh, by the way, we've got another 10 employees um, for a total of about 50 people in Uganda that we support full time. So that's kind of my life over there. And in, in kind of wrapping up everything that we do in Uganda, this, this is big. We just get all kinds of equipment. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but this is really a core thing that we do in Uganda is just provide technology support for all the nonprofits that are on the ground there. Now, that's in a nutshell what we're about. What I want to talk about for most of the talk is what's happened since last year. Um, it's kind of interesting that Hackers for Charity kind of checkpoints itself at DerbyCon now. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like our fiscal year, you know, starts and stops, you know, DerbyCon. But really, um, I get kind of wind in my sails every time I come to DerbyCon and I get energized and I go back and I'm like, woohoo, you know, I can do all this, this stuff. And then right around the time DerbyCon's rolling around again, I'm, you know, sort of crash landing into DerbyCon. And you guys make it easier for me to go back and really make it possible, not just financially, but 
you kind of supercharge me. So I want to talk about kind of what we've done since last DerbyCon. Um, I, I, I won't lie, uh, it's been, you know, it's been a hard year. It, a lot of the years, you know, we run into tough spots and this year was, was really no different. But again, you guys really made all this stuff happen. First thing I want to talk about is the leather program. Last year it was just kind of, we were in training, Jen and I were learning and we had this idea. Uh, this year the program absolutely took off. Um, this year Jen and I figured out how to do things. Jen's an amazing artist, really an unbelievable artist. And I really enjoyed learning about the construction and molding something, you know, ridiculous, you know, you know ridiculously tough into something that is shaped like something and the construction side of it. And um, so we learned enough to start teaching people. Here's uh, some of our folks uh, in training, learning how to uh, dry. They're, they're actually making paper. We take A4 paper and soak it in Ugandan tea and put it out in the sun and put it in journals. It makes the paper look old and the tourists go absolutely nuts for it. Um, so this is a very simple job for folks that really aren't quite there in terms of being able to do the leather work. It gives them the opportunity to work in their villages. You know, they don't really have to come to our workshop. Um, so we got a bunch of people doing that. And then these are photos of folks working inside of our workshop. Uh, the upper left, you can see uh, Johnson. He's there working at the metal table. These, these guys, um, the metal table we use for making those dog tags and the little metal pieces on bracelets. Um, all that stuff is, is handmade. It's cut out of cooking pots. So when a pot gets to the point where they can't use it anymore, it's got holes in it or whatever, we cut it all up and make dog tags, you know, and, and things like that and, you know, bring them to conferences. So lots of stuff going on in the leather program. This stuff is all new since last year. You know, the ability to make this kind of stuff. Um, again, all that artwork and stuff is Jen. It's really fabulous. Um, so the leather program has really exploded this year and we're doing some really cool stuff. Uh, the next thing that has been really huge this year is we kind of got plunged into education. Uh, I told you guys already that we sort of install classrooms. We, you know, we put computers in, in places. And whenever I'd put in a computer, I would install this package called Rachel, which is the remote area community hotspot for education and learning. Uh, a couple, you know, a couple guys that basically said, you know, through their travels, they noticed that bandwidth was a problem in developing countries, but stuff like Wikipedia and Khan Academy was high bandwidth and high value for education. So they took a bunch of that stuff and put it together and made it offline so that you could, you know, hook up a USB drive to a computer, dump all this stuff down and, you know, voila, you have all this, have all this content. Um, and I did that for every computer that we installed. Um, and then something interesting happened. Um, Sam, Sam Kinch started playing around with these Raspberry Pis a couple years ago, you know, and, and I was kind of like, oh, that's neat. I know nothing about hardware, hardware, have fun, you know, and it was, it was kind of geeky and, you know, kind of nerdy. And then at some point something clicked and, you know, we got to the point where we were like, hey, this would be kind of cool in Africa. It's cheap and low power. Um, so this Rachel, this, this uh, software thing and this hardware thing started bouncing around a little bit in, in our heads. You know, there, hey, there's something kind of interesting here. Well, Rachel, which I was really proud of, had all this stuff. You know, it had, a, it had a lot of content, tens of thousands of ebooks, and I mean, you dropped in a computer, you had a library, and you had a curriculum, and you had cool stuff. And I was, like, super proud of that. You know, I was like, that's cool. And I'd show people, look, you click on the con video, and it plays, and you don't have internet, isn't that neat? And I loaded uh, the, this version of Rachel onto a Raspberry Pi, which the folks at Rachel, they have a Pi version, and I took it around, and I'd show it to educators. You know, people that were, that are here, that their focus is education, and then they go to developing countries and they try to teach teachers and develop schools. And the first, the first educator that I really showed it to, I'm holding the Raspberry Pi and I'm like, hey, isn't this cool? And he's like, meh. I was like, you, didn't, you missed it. It's here. You see this? Look, how, it's in my hand, all of this. And he's like, yeah, meh. He's like, this doesn't do anything for me as an educator. And so after I got over the, you know, ego hit of that, you know, it took the hit to my pride, I was like, ready to listen. Okay, well, what don't you like? And he's like, well, first of all, Khan is just videos. That doesn't help me. How do I know if the kids understand it? Heck, how do I know if the kids even watch it? I, wanna, I want tracking. I want to know if the kids are watching the videos. 
I was like, that sounds hard. And, and then he's like, oh, and, and I want all the exercises that Khan Academy has online. I need those too. And oh, by the way, I need them tracked. And I need to know which students are doing well and, and which students aren't. And uh, I need to be able to block students from continuing at certain spots if they don't really understand it. And I was like, oh, dude, you're killing me. <laughs> I was like, this sounds ridiculously hard and frankly boring, you know, because <laughs> this has nothing to do with, you know, te the technology hardware blinky lights on the Pi. <laughs> and um, you can tell I get really excited about things that I'm excited about and, and just the other stuff is you um, but anyway I reached I started doing some research and and I found out that uh, there were some folks that were actually working on a solution that sounded a lot like this and these folks were um, over at uh, learning equality they have this thing called call light which gives you the exercises and the reporting and it's got this little feature that you know each student logs in and you can track them and it pushes all the stuff the data up to a web server whenever this that machine gets online and so you can view it from a central web server and you can see all your schools and I was like haha easy score win install it done and it didn't work <laughs> Like, you know, half the stuff that I thought this thing was going to do for us, it simply didn't. And so I ranted and raved in, you know, this document and sent it off to the developers, you know, and, and they wrote back and they're like, thanks so much for your, you know, for, you know, debugging this for us and finding the problems. We're two days away from a release. Let's see if some of it gets fixed and basically worked with these guys for like a month as they addressed all the problems. So long story short is we were able to address all the needs of the educators with a bunch of key software products that the educators go, this works for us. This software is good. So the software was handled. So I had an open house at the Keep where I showed off the software to a bunch of educators, showed off a bunch of hardware solutions to see what they liked, what worked for them, and they basically came back with something that they liked. And this. What they liked the most was this yellow box that you guys have seen at our booth, which Sam put together. You know, this Raspberry Pi, it's got the battery inside of it, it's got a, you know, a charge controller inside of there, it regulates power, you know, it's Wi-Fi, it's waterproof, it's rugged, it's durable, it's 200 bucks. And for the client, they really like the Chromebook, which I am loving. So the Chromebook is 200 bucks, you hit, you know, three buttons and you reboot it and it's back to factory default if the kids mess it up. So it's very resilient. It's a very nice machine. And so right now we have an education solution new this year, which basically puts all of this content into a classroom for about 200 bucks a seat, okay? Not including the server. Now, the fun part is these yellow boxes some people just want. On our website, we're putting all the instructions for how to build it yourself, but some people are like, shut up and take my money. Give me the yellow box, right? So the idea that we have is, well, let's, let's consider doing like a buy one, give one thing, or specifically a buy one, build one, give one kind of thing, where we have the pieces for these and we use hacker spaces and conferences where we're talking about hardware, and let's build these things at the conferences and in the hacker spaces to kind of learn you know, hardware skills, or for those that are experienced, they can bang it out in 10 minutes. And the idea is you get to keep one and one goes to a school. That way we don't have to get into the business of productizing the thing, but we can serve the community and serve schools with this cool setup. So I, I know that's a lot of stuff, but this is months worth of work of basically listening outside of our circles, listening outside of technology to people that are in education. And I can't emphasize this enough. This, this education thing <laughs> is like the key to changing a lot of countries that are really struggling because I've seen firsthand that the curriculum is simply not up to par and the stage is set for another generation that's exactly like this one. Stuck, you know, only learning to memorize, not learning to think out of the box. Um, and this thing is really gonna unlock a whole lot of doors. So we're super excited about uh, this education thing. We'll keep you posted. Uh, the other thing that's new this year, which was, um, which was fun, was uh, we, we had this amazing opportunity for uh, a documentary to be made about HFC, and it really came out of the blue. Um, it, it's, it hasn't cost us anything, um, you know, and Jeremy and MJ and Rachel, and you know, these folks have been following us in Uganda for, you know, over a month. They came to Uganda and followed us 24-7. I mean, literally, 
you know. Um, I'd, you know, when I would go to work and when I'd come home and when I'd play with my kids and when I'm eating dinner and when I'd go to the bathroom and I lock the door for the bathroom. <laughs> I'd spend, I'd spend three hours in the bathroom, just a little fetal position. I, it wasn't that bad, but you know, after the first three days, we got used to it. And these guys have just been working really hard. Um, we're super excited about um, the documentary. Um, but one, one a really cool thing that happened as a result of the documentary is it forced us to look at what we're doing. You know, they, they said, oh, yeah, it's a great training center, you know, and all this stuff. We, you know, we want to know, is it working? And I was like, oh, that sounds hard. <laughs> you know, I didn't sign up for, is this going to work? It's just, this is what we're doing, and this is the direction that we're being led. And uh, they forced us to take a really hard look at, is what we're doing making a difference? And man, that was, that was tough. You know? um, and so basically what we had to do is we had to start talking to our students, following our students around, following our graduates around. What are you doing now? What's your story? You know, and um, at first I kind of, I was, I was pretty um, scared about that. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to find out that really this stuff isn't working, you know, and every single one of our graduates are criminals and, you know, or they've gone to Nigeria and they're, you know, spammers or... <laughs> <laughs> I was like, if that's, if that's how it's going to turn out, I'm better off not asking, All right? But the fact was, um, the documentary team really turned a lot of things around for me personally. Um, because through all the ups and downs and all the struggles that I've had and, and all the dumb things that I've done and the things that I've done wrong and, and for all the times that I've tried to get back being into being a hacker, you know, instead of this HFC thing, you know, these stories told me that I'm on the right path. That, you know, I don't, I don't have to keep grabbing at all the stuff that I was doing when I was, you know, a pen tester full time and all that. That this is really the right direction. Let me grab a... And so what we found is we found a bunch of stories. Um, let me first introduce you to Michael. So Michael is a guy, is that straight vodka? I think I just got iced. <laughs> All right, I'm at a hacker conference, so here we go. So anyway, this is, uh, this is Michael, and I, I kind of want to, this is just a silent video. I'll kind of talk to you a little bit about Michael. Um, this, this young man, he's 16 years old. He is the head of his household. This guy is, um, he has two younger brothers, and he's the man of the house. He's on his own. Uh, this is where he lives. He lives in a slum uh, in an area that's called Masese. And uh, Masese is the worst of the worst. This is about as bad as Uganda gets. Um, Michael was a street kid. Uh, he was living on the streets with his brother. Uh, a man took him in and let him stay at the house, but from what I understand of the story, the, the arrangement was inappropriate. Um, and I, I can't imagine what that means, you know, but an organization, um, uh, a Ginger Connection found Michael, they help street kids, and basically brought him into a drop-in program to help him try to get back into school, and they have a little school that they run. Uh, Michael was on, um, was, was stoned out of his mind. Glue sniffing is an incredibly huge thing, very addictive. Um, but what you're seeing here is a happy kid. <laughs> you know, big smiles, very happy. Um, and this is his school. We, he took us to his village, we went to his school, and we uncovered this story where we found out that this, this guy, in, in his little, you know, little home, is he's now, the, all three of them are top five in their class. Like, they've been completely turned around. And one thing that was key to this transformation was basically his ability to use a computer. This lady's very excited. <laughs> She's excited because we got to this, to Michael's school and found out that they didn't have a single computer, but Michael is now like this computer wizard. He picked it up so fast and went from, you know, failing all of his classes to being top five because of the computer that we put in. I mean, it literally changed his life. 
So we're like, oh, we can't have that. <laughs> you know, so we brought a computer system and told them that we're going to install it. We're going to give all the teachers free training, which is what we do. And that's why, these, that's why the headmistress there was so excited. She's, they're getting a computer for the first time. And we, we put it in the staff lounge because the teachers needed to learn how to use computers. I mean, most, of the, most of the teachers were computer illiterate, and 16-year-old Michael is a computer wizard. And it, so we're kind of setting it up. I'm giving these guys a bit of an introduction to the computer, you know, setting it up, showing them how it works. And an interesting thing started happening as we were setting this up, you know, and I'm showing them how to do this is you can see Michael in the crowd, you know, I'm showing all the teachers and Michael kind of, you know, pushes his way in. He's like, let me show him, you know, jumps right into that seat and he's showing the teachers how to use the computer. And all the teachers are like, you know, amazed by this. So Michael is a continuing story. I mean, he's not out of the woods yet, um, but it's been really cool to see how he's progressed. The next story I want to tell you about is Paul Eddy, um, and he, he goes by Eddy, two first names there. Um, Paul Eddy was an interesting story. You can see he's got a, he's got a tie on, he looks smart. This guy um, had very little computer experience. He applied for a job at Uganda Baptist Seminary, and they basically said, you don't have the qualifications required for this job. And um, so what he did is he came to Hackers for Charity and uh, paid out of his own pocket because at the time we didn't have sponsorship and anyone that wasn't connected to a nonprofit had to pay a small fee to take some classes. So he paid, he paid for some classes out of his own pocket, got a certificate, went back to UBS and said, hey, you know, I think I qualify now. And they said, you absolutely do. You've got a job. So he landed a job and he's in charge of this computer system um, and it might not look like too much to you, but this is probably one of the most advanced computer centers in Jinja. Um, they've got six end computing stations, all brand new Dell and HP equipment. This is really high end. And Michael was brought in um, to be the technical manager. So he went from not being qualified for the job to training with us to being the technical manager. And now he's in charge of technology for these guys and also the computer teacher. So, and interestingly enough, since UBS is a nonprofit, he now qualifies for free computer classes. And he came back and kept taking classes for free. So it was, you know, kind of like the joke was, the joke was on us, but, you know, I was, I was cool with that. I really have no idea what I'm drinking. That's foul. <laughs> Uh, so, moving on, um, this is Shamim. She had a, she had a pretty cool story. Um, Shamim had, very, had no computer experience. She was compu computer illiterate. Um, she came to the center and took classes in the center uh, and applied for a job um, at a local school and was accepted for the job. Uh, she basically landed that job and became a secretary. Uh, what was really cool, are you icing me? Nice rep, rapid seven. Oh, you dog. <laughs> this is going to taste so much worse. <laughs> <sighs> I used to like you. <laughs> you dog. <clears throat> okay. As soon as I can talk again, I'll move on to the icing. So she, she became the secretary and basically became the local computer whiz. Um, she, she was, uh, man, she's teaching the other secretaries, um, but they really didn't have many computers. Um, you can see here this, um, this mess of crap down at the bottom that's yellow is their computer lab. Um, some, it's a crazy story. This school uh, had a, a white donor, that's what, what they said, come in and say, we will give you uh, a whole computer lab if you make a room for it. And so they built this room and they put in burglar proofing and they ran electric and then the donors took off. They're, you know, like, oops, sorry, I gotta go back to wherever. And so they have this room with this crappy equipment, none of it works. So one of the first things we did was we installed two computer systems into this school. And the way that this works is we'll put a system in and we'll be like, well, let's see how you guys take care of it. Let's see, can you send us pictures? Will your teachers, will all your teachers come for free training? If yes, we'll give you more. You know, if the computer disappears, you know, the teachers don't show up for training, you know, you don't, you don't communicate with us, eh, you know, we, we, we lost that one computer. 
Um, so that's kind of the deal with, with how this works. Uh, next story that we found out, this is Anam. Uh, she's, this is a pretty cool story because she's Pakistani, living in Jinja, computer illiterate. Um, she came in, she took courses, uh, she got not a computer job, which was seven times the average salary for a middle eight, for a middle class Ugandan, as a result of taking these classes. Um, so she went from computer illiterate to making ridiculous money using computers, which that's probably the story of everybody in this room. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what sets her apart is she spent, she sent most of the money back to Pakistan. She lived off a small portion of it and basically supported her family from Pakistan with that job, which we thought was really cool. Um, Hillary, another story, um, you know, this guy, he had very little computer experience. Um, his, his story though, um, actually he had zero computer experience, computer illiterate. He's in school, which is a big deal. It's, school's expensive in Uganda. You spend all this money to get in, you know, and the curriculum sucks and it's terrible and you really don't get job skills, but that's what you're supposed to do. So he and his family, you know, and his mom and everything went into debt to get into school and then there were riots and the teachers went on strike and the police showed up and tear gassed them all so the teachers were like f this you know <laughs> like i'm not going to sit around and be tear gassed so the teachers took off and the school closed and guess what you don't get your school fees back like nope sorry about that <laughs> you know you had two weeks of school you know thanks have a nice day and that was like their life savings right they lost everything so one of our guys in our center actually ran into hillary's mom at church and heard the story and he was like why don't you bring him into the center gave him free training, um, and it basically uh, gave him that drive to get back to school. You know, he had lost his incentive to even try anymore. And um, he got some skills, was able to get a small job, get himself back into school. And now he's not in Jinja anymore, he's moved on to Kampala, to McCrary Business Institute, which is like one of the highest ranking schools in the country. Um, extremely expensive, and he got in on a scholarship. So this was literally, you know, went from being tear gassed out of school to, you know, getting into a very, very prestigious place. We, we talked about Umaru last year, another story of a kid um, who's a double orphan, got, you know, um, the bottom of his class. We installed a computer system at Children of Grace. Uh, he went in there, he started getting interested in computers. Now he wants to be a doctor. He's top in his class now. He went from absolute bottom to absolute top. And I mean, I could go on all day with this. I mean, the, you know, the number of stories that we have, I mean, these are, it's, it goes on and on. We have, we were able to uncover so many stories, so many successes of people that have done this kind of thing. Uh, and like I said, it really, it really made us look at this and go, we're doing the right thing. Like we're in the right place. And this was the first time that that, I really felt like that. Um, and you know, and it was thanks to this film crew coming out. So very cool. Uh, this is this is a weird this is a weird one. Uh, child sponsorship is a word that it just ugh. it's like you know smearing off ice in the mouth. You know it's um, it. This is a dirty word in Uganda because this is the number one way to basically steal people's money. You know you show pictures like this and you're like send us money and you know we'll put them in school and then you send them money and then they go and buy a car. You know I mean it's it's horrible. Like you know this happens all the time. So. I kind of hate to call this child sponsorship, uh, but that's kind of what it is. I, I was sent this news article, um, and it says, Child Oz Jinjo with technical skills. So, of course, I saw the article, I was like, huh? I was like, is he one of our students? And it turned out that what this kid was doing was his, his uncle, um, he's, uh, he's nine years old, his uncle was visiting, and he repairs cell phones and radios. So the uncle visits for two weeks, um, his name's Hatim, this little boy, kind of sticks with his uncle and starts getting interested in cell phones and radios and what his uncle is doing. The uncle takes off after two weeks and this little kid opens his own business repairing cell phones and radios. I was like, really? <laughs> so of course I'm like, holy smokes, like this, this is great, you know, I'm loving this. But it gets even better. The kid the kid is building radios, repairing cell phones, but he didn't have any tools. He would make tools out of things like bicycle spokes, 
you know, he didn't have screwdrivers, so he'd get a bicycle spoke and hit it with a hammer until it was like a screwdriver, you know? And I was like, oh my goodness. So I read it in a Ugandan paper, so the first thing that I did was, you know, let's see if it's true, <laughs> so, you know? So I sent my technician out there very quietly, you know, I didn't want the white dude to show up. Oh yes, it's very true, you know, of course it is. Yeah, so my technician goes and he's very quiet and asking questions in his own way. And it turned out the story was absolutely true. You know, we found Hatim and sure enough, he's repairing radios and cell phones with bike spokes. Um, he's, the story got even crazier because the little bit of money that he's making is feeding his family. You know, and he can't afford to go to school because he's not making enough money in his business to feed his family and go to school. There's something a little upside down about a nine-year-old, you know, being the one that's working. Um, so um, I talked to the, the board, I talked to HFC guys, and I was like, you know, we should do something for this kid. Um, let's get his school fees paid, let's buy him some tools, and let's get him into our training center and just, you know, feed this kid. Um, so it's, you know, it's kind of cool. You can see him here working. This was his, this is kind of the before video, right? Um, you can see the very rudimentary tools. Um, you know, obviously the, the kid isn't, the kid only has as much knowledge as he got from his uncle and what he's explored with. He hasn't had any practical training, but, you know, he gets the job done. Uh, pretty amazing. So basically what we did is uh, we paid for his school fees. This is him in his, in his new uniform. Uh, bought him a toolkit. Here's his new toolkit. Here he's uh, paid for his books and you know, his shoes. Went to the school and actually got you know, a photograph of the headmaster signing for the money for the school fees and a receipt. <laughs> you know, so that money couldn't wander off. And it, so we're calling it kind of a little child sponsorship thing. Um, you know, finding kids like this uh, in the U.S. would, I think, would be pretty spectacular. You know, a nine-year-old that, you know, kind of jumped in this quickly and showed this much talent. But in Uganda, it's absolutely exceptional. So, good stuff. Uh, next, Food for Work. How many people remember the Food for Work program? Good. Oh, God, I keep forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> we'll work for something besides ice. How's that program? Oh, yeah, the Food for Work program was one of those things that we started because we were doing computer stuff for people, but there were a lot of people starving, you know, and it, it was kind of like, you know, I felt pressured. <laughs> you know, I was like, well, let's feed some people and then I don't have to feel as bad about doing computer stuff, which was absolute bull crap. Um, you know, it's, it's no reason to make a decision or to get into something that you think other people think you should get into, and it, it kind of failed. Um, but. I'm happy to say that it, the Food for Work program is kind of reinvented. Uh, these shirts that we had this year, uh, the Hunger is No Game shirt, basically all of the proceeds of this shirt go into our new food program. And basically what we're doing is we're spending the money on programs that we know are going to spend it properly. Um, and when we were out with the film crew, we went on night raids um, with Ginger Connection that works with Street Kids, where Michael is from. And we'd go around and they would try to find kids on the street that you know, didn't have a home, that weren't in the system, that weren't getting school. Um, but it was specifically focused on children. You know? So there's a lot of organizations focused on street kids. But there's very few people that are actually helping homeless adults. So we talked to Allison and we were like, you know, if we were to redo this food program thing, is, is there a way that maybe we could help the, the homeless adults that were on the street, you know, maybe do a food program, feed them a couple times a week, do something to help? And she said, absolutely. So uh, Nathan over here was kind of the one that approached me a few years ago with the, you know, I'm hacking world hunger, you know, shirts. And I was kind of like, who's this goofball? You know, but he's really excited about the shirts. And I was like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, dude, you know, he's got, he's got the spunk and I'm, I'm going to let him run with this thing and we put the shirts in the booth and it turned out that really what he wanted to do was revitalize this program. So Nathan's kind of run with that. Mary did an awesome job on the design with these shirts. Um, and so all of that is going into a food program. So that shirt's a little bit different than all the others. Um, you know, our shirt thing, you know, Glenn and Mary and, you know, everyone that kind of pitches in to help with these shirts, it makes a big difference. Um, in fact, uh, you know, I've, I've heard that it even gets you a police discount at coffee shops. Uh, this, this, is, this is what he told me. You know, he just walked in, he's trying to, you know, he's trying to buy his bagel and coffee and they rang him up on a police discount and he's got the receipt to prove it. Didn't even have to say anything. 
It's like, dude, I was so shocked. I couldn't, I couldn't speak. And I was like, so anyway, buy, you know, buy our shirts and they pay for themselves. That's right. <laughs> Um, one other thing that we did, um, we've done a lot with the Ugandan police, we're usually very quiet about it, um, but oh, I'm, I'm being less and less quiet about it. Um, some, of you, some of you heard that um, about a year ago, Al-Shabaab basically said, hey, we're going to blow up this mall, you know, we're, we're going to blow up this mall in Nairobi a year ago, and uh, last week they basically did. 15 people went in, executed 69 people, um, took hostages, um, and Al-Shabaab was like, hey, we told you so. Um, the, the thing that is, I mean, it's, it's obviously a horrible thing, but it strikes really close to home. My kids go to school an hour from this mall. Um, the, uh, some, of their, some of their dorm mates were in that mall. Um, you know, and the stories of, you know, one of, one of my son Trevor's uh, dorm mates was going up an escalator and a terrorist with, a, with an AK-47 was going down the opposite one and just opened, fired on him and every single bullet missed him. You know, just this hail of gunfire and absolutely missed him and he found his dad and hid in a shop and they called, you know, his, his mom and sister and they were in another shop and they said, hey, there's a, there's a bunch of police here, they're taking people out, should I go with them? And the dad's like, no, you stay there. And it turned out that those police were actually Al Shabaab and executed all of those people. You know, the, this this kind of stuff. You know, um, it, I mean, it, it's a test of faith. You know, I'm, we're living in a, an extremely dangerous place. My wife was in Nairobi um, visiting the kids that week. She, you know, kind of went with another lady, and I'm nervous enough. But this this stuff um, this stuff is crazy. Now, this is Kenya, but as af when this thing finished. Al Shabaab basically said, "Hey, we're going to blow up malls in Kampala next, and that's where we live." Um, so Al Shabaab is basically, you know, and Al Qaeda—they're basically running rampant, you know, all over East African countries because there's no one to stand up to them. Um, so I feel really um, strongly that we need to do what we can to try to help the Uganda police. Um, they need help. Um, I took the film crew there and I had my pwn pad, the Pony Express donated a pwn pad to us, and I got my pwn pad as I'm walking up to police headquarters with the film crew and, you know, broke into one of their networks, you know, it was running WEP, and it, it took like, you know, whatever, 20 seconds, and I'm sitting there and I show it to the police and I'm like, we want to help you with this stuff, <laughs> you know, this shouldn't be happening, and they bring in their technical guys and everything, and technical guys look at it and they go, which network was it? And I was like, it, it's your main network, you know, it's, it's called Uganda Police Force. He kind of looks at it and he goes, oh, good. He's like, that's not the one the chief of police uses. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, that, that's not a problem. That's just the one the forensics guys use. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, are you serious? So one thing that we want to try to do is we're trying to get these guys some training. I mean, obviously they're, they're seriously lacking. Um, Art of Exploitation has offered uh, to come to Uganda and actually do some training for Uganda police. Uh, a friend of mine at Mile 2 has also donated software as well, so we're going we're gonna to give it a shot. We're going to try to do legitimate forensics training uh, for Uganda police and you know, just, see, just try to do what we can to help. Um, this is one of the last stories. Uh, Children of Grace um, was, we installed a computer system for those guys and man, they went to town on it. These machines were used constantly. Um, and then somebody came in and stole their server. <laughs> and you know, they called me and they're like, we want to replace the server, can you tell us the specs? And this thing had been in for about two years and it had been kept spot free, no dust on it, and had been used constantly by their students. So this year we basically went in and we replaced that you know, replace that server to keep those guys going. That's where uh, Umaru trained, one of the guys we talked about. Um, and I'll share, I'll share this, this with you because this was the other indicator that, you know, we're on the right track. You know, we're doing the right things. Um, when I applied for our kids to go to Rift Valley Academy, they have two different rates. Um, there are three different rates. They have rates for missionaries, um, which, you know, it's a, it's a Christian school started by missionaries, 200 years old, which is the cheapest, and then they have um, national rates, and then they have expat rates, you know, which is the highest. And they charged us as expats, um, which it's, it hurts. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of money. It's an expensive school. 
Um, so when I, folks in the community in Jinja heard that, other missionaries basically started writing letters and said, well, you know, these guys are helping us do what we do. If it wasn't for, for HFC, we couldn't do what we do, so give them a good rate, and started writing these letters, which by itself was, I thought, pretty amazing. Um, but the content of the letters really got me. Uh, we would not be successful in our ministry without the support of Hackers for Charity. HFC came to my rescue when my hard drive died. They restored documents vital to our organization's missionary work. We recently had a lightning strike. Johnny and hackers were able to take a fried hard drive and recover our data without charging for labor or parts. We'd be in a massive hole if they weren't here to help. They looked after our needs, were very grateful. HFC continues to meet desperate need at our location, providing technologists that are honest and well-equipped to assist us free of charge. The Longs and HFC helped us by repairing about a half a dozen ancient laptops that have been donated. I was about to throw them out, but the staff was able to resurrect them, and most are still in use today. Um, that stuff hit me like square, and I was like, we are absolutely in the right spot. Um, and this, there's no arguing, this is good stuff. Uh, but uh, I've had trouble over the past four years since I started Hackers for Charity answering two simple questions. And I mentioned this in the beginning, and maybe some of you have struggled with it too. The first question is, what is HFC about? I, I gave you the pitch. Can anybody recite it? Can anybody tell me, what's HFC about? Give me some stuff. What do we do? Absolutely. That's great. Teaching about technology so that they can get beyond where they are. Good. What else? Giving people opportunities. Good. Giving opportunities. Great. Enabling other charities. Yes. Enabling other charities. Good. Hope. Good stuff. Hope. What's that? Enabling people. Enabling people. Absolutely. Breaking, but the cycle of Breaking the cycle of poverty with education. That's our new marketing manager in the CIA hat. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Now, this is our mission statement, right? I mean, this is what we're supposed to be about. But what I'd like to offer is I'd like to offer a translation of our mission statement. Uh, what we, let's, let's simplify it, right? What is HFC? Hackers using their skills, let's cross all this out, to change the world, one person and one charity at a time. Right? It sounds a little, it might be a little pie in the sky for some of you, but it boils it down, right? I mean, I, I like to look at it kind of in this way because it helps me kind of focus on some key things like what you guys picked out. So hackers using their skills to change the world one person, one charity at a time. I think, I think it's not, not a bad summary. So that's a good summary. Question number two, who is HFC? That's always been a hard one. Who is HFC? Pointing at me? Oh, I'm oh, sorry. <coughs> Who is HFC? It's Rob Fuller. Smoobix. It's everyone here. Well, maybe all right. Let me let's let's try this. If you're with HFC, stand up. I see some here. All right? All right? All right. If you donated hardware, stay up, guys. If you donated hardware, stand up. Anyone? There. Applause. <laughs> Bought anything from our table? Stand up. Keep going. Applause. Donated for auction. Bid on an auction item. Worked at an HFC booth. Stay up. Stay up. Help tear down a booth. Stand up. Made a donation. Stand up. Retweeted HFC. Stand up. Follow Friday HFC. Bought an HFC shirt. Stand up. Worn an HFC shirt. Gotten dirty looks for wearing an HFC shirt. 
accosted for wearing an HFC shirt. Gotten a police discount for wearing an HFC shirt. Told someone about HFC. Right? Keep standing up. Who is HFC? This is it, right? This is it. HFC is you. You guys deserve that applause. I mean, the stuff that you've done, all of this, you know, if we boil it into categories, this stuff that you've done, the money, the giving, the buying, the helping, all of that stuff made all the stuff that you just saw possible. You did this. You did this. It was all in Uganda for the most part, though. And that bugs me. Because, honestly, I'm tired of being selfish. I'm doing the fun stuff and you guys are paying for it. This is fun. This changed my life and this is why I went to Uganda. Was because of this stuff. How that feels when you do that. So, I'm sick of doing the fun stuff and having you guys pay for it. That's why it's your turn. We launched this last year. It's the Volunteer Network. It didn't work. Keep standing up, Some, all of you that can, all right? We launched it last year to find out who was interested. About a thousand people. Um, Vito came in and programmed this thing. It is all new. Now, I'm not going to tell you about it. We have a video on the front page that talks about it. And we're going to go to the booth and we're going to talk about it some more for those of you that are interested, okay? But this lets you sign up as a volunteer, list your skills, charities can sign up, list their needs. As a donor, you can sign up and tell me what you've got and the system will match you together. It does all the work. It does all the work to give you the ability to do all of this because it's life-changing, okay? And I got this, how many of you saw the internship? Show of hands. Anybody, nobody's seen this movie? All right, I gotta show you this clip. Watch this clip. And what you have done as a team is connect to people and connect those people to information, which is what we do. And more than that, you have the courage to dream. In spite of your obvious and astonishing limitations, <laughs> never gave up on that dream. That's a great quote. So that's it. That's the point of the talk. It's your turn, guys. Our biggest challenge, I think, is not getting the volunteers, the people that haven't stood up yet involved, or to get the people that are standing up re-involved. Our challenge is going to be finding charities to help. That's a good problem to have. So at our booth, we got a bunch of cards that you guys can give out to charities as you sign up for the system. I'm going to go over there right now. I'm not going to take any questions, and we're going to chat, okay, in the vendor room. Anybody wants to learn about this thing, this is it. It's your turn. Thank you guys for all, of, all that you've done. Let's keep going.